So I'd just like to begin by introducing Ayla's Earth Laws Month. So we've got more than 30 online events celebrating humanity's relationship with the living world. So I do encourage you all to go to our website and check out our wonderfully exciting program. So today... Our webinar we are hosting is on ecocide in Australia and what's possible. Um, but before we begin, I think it's really important for us all to acknowledge country. So today um, I'm here on the traditional lands of the Yugambeh people in Numingbar Valley. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge elders, past, present and emerging and the ongoing history, legacy and current day impacts of colonisation. And I'd also like to acknowledge the remarkable governance systems that Indigenous Australians have developed. And with that, um, I just have an image here of Aboriginal Australia and all of the hundreds of nations um, that have been here for over 50,000 years. So today, uh, what we'll be exploring is what it might look like if we were to recognise ecocide law as a crime in Australia. So we've got some really amazing speakers here today and each of them will have 10 minutes each to share and then we will have Q&A at the end. Uh, so we've, firstly, we've got Rob White, who is an adjunct at the University of Tasmania, who has written pro prolifically about green criminology, eco-justice and climate politics. Secondly, we have Gwyn McCarrick, who currently works at an Aboriginal legal service in North Queensland, and she's been helping lead our research within AILA uh, and also used to be with uh, the University of Tasmania. We then have Danielle Salamaya, who's a professor of sociology and criminology at the University of Sydney and the deputy director of the Sydney Environment Institute and lead of the Multi-Justice Species Project. We also have Anthony Burke, who teaches in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of New South Wales. Um, so we do encourage you, if you do have any questions along the way, please put them in the chat. Michelle and I will help facilitate this at the end once our speakers have finished their wonderful presentations. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Michelle, our national convener here at the Australian Earth Laws Alliance to introduce herself and to kick the webinar off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> excuse me, and thank you for that excellent introduction. Oh, excuse me, I, I do apologise, folks. I'm just coming, getting over um, a rather nasty flu. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I normally live, work and play on Yagara and Turrbal country in Brisbane. I'm actually travelling today and tomorrow and definitely want to acknowledge uh, the uh, Bidjigal and Gadigal peoples of the Aurora Nation. Um, it's my great pleasure to be part of this discussion today. Um, the folks who are going to follow me um, actually know a lot more in the details about ecocide. Um, Gwyn McCarrick will be giving um, an, an introduction uh, to the, 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 what we're calling the Experts International Panel and their definition of what ecocide could be defined as uh, for the purposes of making law. Um, and then we'll be having a talk by Danielle looking at some of the more um, earth-centred issues to do with ecocide. But what's really excellent is then Rob White will be talking about the criticisms he has of the current expert panel definition and how we could do things differently. And then Anthony Burke will be wrapping up for us at the end, um, looking at sort of the broader issues of what we, what we could do here in Australia. But my short introduction is really to lay the little bit of context for folks. I know a lot of people on this call perhaps already know a lot about ecocide. And I just wanted to give a little bit of the history um, and mention why the Australian Earth Laws Alliance um, considers it very important that Australia join this conversation at a number of different levels. So first of all, anyone who doesn't know who AILA is, um, the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, uh, we state that our objective is to play a part in increasing the understanding and actual implementation of Earth-centred governance. Uh, we focus on systems change, but by being informed by Earth jurisprudence and Indigenous governance, we have a particular focus on trying to, I often refer to it as cracking open the concrete of the colonised Western 
systems that have been laid across the continent. Um, so that the, the beauty, the greenery, the flowers um, of first laws and earth laws and new ways forward can, can kind of erupt through that. So what Ayla is really interested in is how we can build an earth-centred society or an ecological society. With that in mind, um, inside the Australian Earth Laws Centre, we look across a whole range of different issues. And um, I think it's now um, coming up to two years ago, we connected with the International Stop Ecocide Campaign um, because we were aware that there wasn't a branch in Australia. There were a whole range of excellent academics, researchers, thinkers, and some advocates. Um, but so today, what um, Ayla is involved in is two things. We are supporting the active branch of the Stop Ecocide International campaign, which I'll talk about briefly in a moment, and want to give a plug for a webinar tonight with Jojo Meta about that very topic. But secondly, and the purpose of today's webinar, is that um, we're very, very interested in how we develop these, um, these bigger ideas around ecocide for the unique legal systems inside Australia. And that's why the discussion today is going to be really interesting. Um, uh, Gwyn has some lovely insights into how uh, some aspects of ecocide could be um, relatively, with policy will, easily integrated into existing laws, um, but there's so many different options. So that's our broader interest. Um, and as Christina said, this webinar today is part of uh, Ayla's Earth Laws Month. I put the link in. Uh, I think many of you uh, already know about Earth Laws Month. I think we've just reached, clocked up 35 events that we're hosting this month to celebrate um, the wonder of um, the living world, but particularly through the lens of all of the amazing folks we're connected to through law, economics, Indigenous knowledge, um, education, and the, create, the creative spaces around the arts, and also economics, if I didn't mention that already. So what is ecocide? <clears throat> We're going to talk about the different definitions, but the simplest way to get your head around it is this idea of massive damage and destruction to ecosystems. So this idea of massive damage and destruction to ecosystem, ecosystems is a basic idea. But how people advocate for that to be recognised as a crime differs from place to place and differs from opinion to opinion. So what a lot of people um, understand in terms of the historical context of ecocide, and I'll weave my way backwards gently, many people in Australia possibly first heard about ecocide through the remarkable work of Polly Higgins, um, a really wonderful woman, force of nature, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. But Polly and Jojo Mehta uh, started the Stop Ecocide International campaign many years ago. And as I said, tonight from 7.30 to 8.30, uh, Jojo Mehta will be giving an update on the international campaign. Uh, and Christina, I wonder if we get a moment later, you could put the link in for people to register for tonight if they haven't already. However, the idea of massive damage and destruction to the environment became particularly relevant in the international context uh, after, well, sort of during and after the Vietnam War. Um, and I was just checking my facts and figures. Apparently the first time ecocide was used in relation to the Vietnam War inside an international forum was actually in 1972 at the Stockholm uh, gathering um, where the Swedish PM accused the United States of committing ecocide um, by dumping Agent Orange across, the con across their country through the war. And that's a, a really horrific herbicide that killed vast tracts of vegetation and caused huge harm to all of life, including people. So ecocide became a more prevalent term um, after those discussions in the 70s. But interestingly, and this is where this comes to, where can we say or declare that ecocide is a crime and how can we do that? The Stop Ecocide International Group have a very particular focus. They want to have ecocide recognised as a crime in one particular instrument in international law referred to as the Rome Statute. They want to make ecocide the fifth crime inside the Rome Statute. Now, that statute was created in 1957, um, and there are four core existing international crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crimes of aggression. And around all of them, there's very detailed discussions. And what they want to do is have ecocide listed as the fifth crime. Um, and that's in the Rome Statute, which would have an impact in international law. But I guess in terms of giving context, what I wanted to mention 
question is that there are other ways to recognise ecocide as a crime. And I think some of our speakers may talk about it today, but some folks advocate for a brand new international treaty recognising ecocide as a crime. And other people are far more focused on what could happen in domestic law and inside um, national laws. Correct me if I'm wrong, Christina, but there's about a dozen countries now that have ecocide in their domestic laws. Um, many of them are uh, nations now that were former states inside the USSR. Um, when people look to those uh, laws, they can certainly see what's been drafted in the law, but there haven't been a lot of um, cases or activity that would actually develop that as jurisprudence or law. So Again, ecocide as a basic concept is this idea of massive extensive damage to the ecosystem. Polly Higgins used to talk about it as um, ongoing or long lasting harm. Some people have put sizes and measurements around it and we'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Um, but I guess for those who are new to the idea of ecocide, I just wanted to give you that concept that it's not a new idea, but getting it into law um, is still something that people are really working hard to do. Other than those half a dozen countries around the world that have recognised ecocide as a crime in their jurisdictions, uh, do note that ecocide is not yet recognised in international law and it absolutely does not exist anywhere in Australian law. Um, I think the only other thing I wanted to mention is that, interestingly, if you dig a little further back, um, even before the Rome Statute was put in place, there were discussions back in those days about having ecocide as a crime but it wasn't taken up, it wasn't seen as um, a way to go. So that is really all I wanted to do um, and just mention, um, I think I was going to share screen and show folks our website, but I don't think I will. I'm going to, I'm more interested in hearing what other people have to say. Um, but the reason that Ayla at the end of the day is interested in this concept of ecocide, and we're actually quite open-minded about how some of these ideas get developed in practice, is we support any idea that puts the living world and the health of all of nature and life and people first above corporate and other uh, commercial interests or other ideologies. So if even having conversations about ecocide generates and stimulates conversations that can help us progress to become much more civilised in our legal systems and in our culture in the industrialised West, uh, then that's what I'm absolutely pro. I really want to be for recognising that the health of the living world is primary and we really need legal systems um, to back up the cultural belief that the living world matters and that it is everything and we're part of it. So um, to save Christina coming back on, I'm going to say that's it from me. We'll now hand over to Gwyn. Um, and I'm not sure if we mentioned, uh, because Danielle has to leave shortly after her talk, um, we're going to have a few minutes questions after Danielle's talk, but the rest of us will wait and we'll have a big discussion at the end with our discussions. So thank you so much. Um, and over to you, Gwyn. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Michelle, can you hear me? Yes, but you are a bit soft. I don't, you might have to speak up or lean into your computer. Perfect. Beautiful. Well, thank, and thank you, Michelle. Thank you for the fantastic uh, overview of Ecoside and that uh, really good introduction um, to uh, the, the topic. Um, so the slides today, and, and there's, there's a, uh, a short amount of time, so I'll just um, get straight into, into the content. Um, the focus that I wanted to have a quick look at today is the mechanics, I suppose, <clears throat> of making ecocide law in Australia. Um, so um, the first thing to recognise um, is, just to change slides, is that... Sorry, ecocide... I don't mean to interrupt, Gwyn. I don't know if you know, but we can see your big slide and then all your little slides on the left. Did you want to hit... Um... I'll hit, hit the slideshow. Other, some people don't like to use that format. It's hard, but yeah, okay. okay Thanks a lot. Perfect. No worries. So um, as Michelle indicated in, in the beginning, ecocide is a threshold crime. Um, the word ecocide comes from the idea uh, or the, the etymology of the word eco, uh, which has its roots in, in uh, the Greek word ekos, meaning house, and, and has been adapted to mean habitat or environment. 
and side, which comes from the Latin verb sidra, meaning to cut down or to kill. So essentially when we put eco and side together, it really translates to this idea of killing the environment. Um, so we can understand ecocide really as a threshold crime. Um, and it's really, it, it can be understood um, in the same way as we understand uh, genocide as being the destruction uh, in whole or in part of a racial or ethnic group. Um, ecocide is the destruction um, of uh, the, the environment. Um, so it's a threshold crime in that it's moving the debate away from global governance and regulation of the environment um, uh, and moving the debate towards the criminalization um, on, and prosecution of the worst examples. So as Michelle said, ecocide is not yet a crime, um, but the proposal at an international level is to um, adopt ecocide as the fifth crime um, embedded in the International Criminal Code, if you like, or the Rome Statute, um, and it would sit there alongside the other four atrocity crimes, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and, and the crime of aggression. So if um, the international campaign was successful in getting ecocide up as an international crime, um, it would be very much a game changer and would bring the um, environmental crime under that constellation of uh, criminal law and penal sanction. So um, uh, more recently, we've had a, um, a working definition uh, so the Stop Ecocide campaign, the international campaign, um, uh, recruited a panel of experts to uh, define um, uh, ecocide. Uh, they define ecocide as um, uh, law, unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Um, and in this context, this expert panel says that the environment means the earth, its biosphere, cryosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere and atmosphere, as well as um, outer space. So um, uh, by and large, the international community has fallen uh, behind this, this um, agreed um, panel, expert panel uh, definition. Um, and so that has got um, us about the work of, of if, um, if we can agree on, on a, a general um, idea of what ecocide is, um, then that focuses on us on, on how to go about implementing this as a law. Now, in the international um, negotiations, ecocide was there when they were initially um, negotiating the Rome Statute, but it fell off the negotiation table. So the international community is really trying to put that uh, crime back on the, on the negotiation table. So um, in terms of how do we get there, there's a, just a couple of things that we need to, to understand. The first thing to understand is that environmental law has historically uh, been uh, a national uh, responsibility. That is to say, um, environmental law has grown up, up around um, this idea that, that states have uh, an exclusive right or what we call sovereignty over their natural resources. Um, and um, the interpretation of that in many countries as, as being an, an exclusive right to, um, uh, to, um, to use and exploit those, those natural resources to extinction if, if they so desire, that, that that's an unbridled uh, ex, um, na national right over its, over its sovereignty. Um, and so international law has been trying to rein that in and trying to get some sort of, of um, uh, traction where it comes to global gov governance of, of uh, the environment. So international, uh, sorry, environmental law has largely been um, domestically regulated and grown up around this idea of permissive regimes. So we've set about 
um, issuing permits and license to pollute in a system of regulating harm as opposed to, um, uh, to where we are now at to the criminalization of harm. So the first thing, the first point is that environmental law um, has traditionally fallen to the states. The second thing to note is that criminal law has also been an exclusive responsibility of the nation states. We have no international police force um, and no international crimes where there's consensus on what those crimes should be, except um, where we find those crimes in the Rome Statute, in the, those atrocity crimes. Uh, or where states between them have agreed on what constitutes transnational crime. But, but, um, but by and large, criminal law has also been uh, the province of, of uh, the, the nation state. So in many, many ways, our Westphalian system of states has really uh, failed us where it comes to in, um, environmental uh, regulation. Um, so, and the third thing is, um, is that international law uh, works largely on a consensus basis. So things rise to the surface when they become what we call um, uh, crimes that are, uh, or sorry, laws that are recognized through usage um, and through, um, uh, you know, uh, general acceptance or what we call juice code juice cogence crime, um, uh, laws, laws that are becoming compelling law. So, and the only real way that we can get there is by what we call vertical integration. That is to say that um, it's either the laws are made at the top and they trickle down or domestic laws and they, they become vertically integrated at an international level through um, an acceptance that they are now compelling law through the states um, using, using these laws. So in, in, a, in effect, um, that, um, those three circles there on, on the screen, international um, environmental crime is in that sweet spot somewhere there between environmental law, criminal law, and international law. Um, so um, the next, so in terms of vertical integration, and this is where I, I get to the work of um, Australian Earth Law Alliance and uh, the working committee that um, Ayla has, has established. So, um, so really about um, embedding um, we, we need to, if we are to get ecocide recognized as, as a crime, we need to work on that vertical integration, embedding uh, ecocide laws in domestic legislation. Um, and, and here, Christina uh, has done a lot of work on, on looking at, at um, all of the national um, uh, jurisdictions that have been, um, that have uh, criminalized ecocide. Um, and part of that has been looking at the translations and, and, and how they actually um, are, are going about that process of, of um, uh, codification. Um, so, and as uh, Michelle has said earlier, a lot of the pre-work in terms of early adoption of, of uh, ecocide law and domestic legislation uh, was done by the late Polly Higgins and her predecessor, Jojo Mehta. Um, and tonight, um, Ayla hosts Jojo Mehta giving a speech on, on um, the, the recent campaign and the um, uh, the work, particularly in, in the Pacific, where they've really concentrated a lot of their efforts um, on, on Pacific nations. Um, so, um, so really, um, re the work is about that embedding of ecocide legislation in, in domestic legislation. Um, and we can work on this as in, in a two-pronged um, approach. You can embed legislation in in uh, in, in the criminal uh, code. Um, the other uh, part of it is uh, the, is 
the, um, similarly, the work of Alvela, which is really about systems change um, and looking at uh, rights of nature laws, prohibiting that human uh, activities where they interfere with the ability of ecosystems and natural communities to exist and flourish. And around the world, the um, rights of nature movement has really um, picked up the, the, the challenge. Countries like um, uh, Ecuador and Bolivia have actually enshrined uh, rights of nature into their constitution. Um, and some countries have even extended vi um, victimhood um, to their uh, rivers and, and, and rainforests. An example of that is, is um, New Zealand that's granted um, uh, a legal, um, uh, uh, legal rights uh, to the Wanganui um, uh, River. So we've got examples of all around the world, the rights of nature movement uh, working in tandem with the criminal, um, the criminal uh, uh, agenda to really uh, to work on two fronts, systems change and, and also um, uh, the, the codification agenda. Um, I think just being cheeky and letting you know um, we've reached 11 minutes. So oh, um, sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I do go on. That, but thank you. Okay, so um, the working committee then within um, um, AILA has been looking at um, uh, uh, the codification of ecocide and, and how we might um, embed that in, um, in domestic legislation. Australia is interesting in that uh, the responsibility for criminal law is really divided between the states um, uh, and the territories and the Commonwealth. Um, but if you look across Australia, we've got different, different, um, different um, criminal definitions, different sentencing regimes, different uh, 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 examples of, of criminal procedure. So by and large, we've had to really concentrate on what we call the code states, that's Western Australia, Queensland and Tasmania. Um, which are the states that have um, have uh, criminal codes um, in all other uh, Australian states. They've still got the common law uh, criminal system, albeit sort of heavily uh, codified. Um, so the re really the work of, of um, the working committee has been looking at how you might draft uh, legislative uh, bills, what would be the mechanics of that, Whereabouts would you embed um, those laws? Uh, do you put it in the criminal code? Do you put it? Um, do you include it as part of of um, uh, environmental pr uh, criminal provisions? Um, and to that end, we really have uh, begun the work on a on a draft bill for um, uh, to implement uh, within the Tasmanian criminal code. Um, and just also to to um, to mention the other type of work that that Australian Earth Laws um, does in terms of its people's tribunals and and the contribution that that makes also in law reform in um, generating um, sophisticated legal analysis. Um, on, on diverse ecological harm cases, making recommendations um, about how we can mitigate uh, harm to the environment and really working on that educational front as well. And there is a long tradition um, throughout uh, the world of, of people's tribunals really making a contribution in, in that space. Um, so in, in my view, what... Um, what is possible? How do we how do we get there? It's 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 that um, double approach um, that those tandem parallel approaches of systems change uh, through uh, rights of nature um, and um, and secondly the, the criminalization of of harm. Um, and and moving um, really from uh, as I say governance. Um, uh, uh, system uh, where something is in criminal law uh, malum in se or something that is is um, in itself har um, harmful and wrong to a malum prohibitor a, 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 a um, uh, an idea that we're drawing a line in the sand and we say here and no further 
This is a threshold, a criminal threshold. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the international community have been um, about that work for many years. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the work in Australia is really to, to, to take um, uh, that work and, and gain momentum at, at a domestic uh, level. Um, just as a historical footnote, and I'll end here, um, often people say to me, well, you know, how would you ever get a corporation um, uh, prosecuted for an environmental crime? Um, they're a fictitious entity. You know, how do you get, you, you pull back that um, corporate veil and, and actually prosecute, uh, you know. Um, and I say to them, there is precedent. Um, after the Second World War, the company Ickfarben, um, uh, was a, a, a German chemical company, um, and it uh, manufactured the uh, the gas Zyklon uh, Zyklon B, um, and uh, that ga gas was of course used to commit a genocide on uh, millions of European Jews in the Holocaust. Um, that company, or the executives of that company, were um, ultimately tried for under the provisions of individual criminal responsibility and found to be complicit for facilitating crimes. So we can do it there. We can, it's, it's as Michelle said, uh, really very much up to the political will um, and the acceptance that the, in, the international community as a whole need to, to both work on, on an international level, but also to work at a domestic level and really infiltrate our um, uh, vertically integrate law, those laws in, into our systems. And as I say, in tandem with the, the, uh, the rights of nature uh, movement that's really wrapping around uh, that effort. So thank you, I'm sorry for going over time. No worries at all. Thank you so much, Gwyn, for that wonderful presentation. I'd now like to hand over to Danielle to give her talk. Uh, thank you. I want to acknowledge that I am on the unceded land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation uh, to pay my respects to elders past and present. And I normally live, work and play on the lands of the Darawal and Yuan people. Uh, I'm very sorry that I'm going to have to talk and run. I don't like to do that, but I had a prior commitment uh, at one o'clock. So I, I, I want to impart... Uh, orient my remarks in response to what Michelle said at the beginning about what is the right approach and also to this notion of ecocide being a threshold of crime. And the normal mindset of criminal law where we think of criminality as being exceptional just does not describe the world that we're in. We're actually in a world where ecocide is not exceptional. It's not beyond some threshold that is outside the norm of what's going on. It is completely normalised in our political and economic systems. And, and I think that as an activist community, as an academic community, uh, my view is that we have to really take seriously the nature of the catastrophe that we're in and ask ourselves whether the type of slow, incremental compromise work that we are so used to doing is appropriate to this moment. I think this is the big question that we need to ask ourselves. So I just want to start by looking at where we are, right? So let's start with the 2019, 2020 fires, which killed 3.25 billion native animals immediately. It's a completely unfathomable number. If we spent 10 seconds with each of those animals, we would be here for 1,030 years, just to give us some embodied sense of what that means. Burnt 18.5 million hectares of land, depriving surviving animals of the conditions to sustain life, interrupting relations of mutuality, uh, breaking those virtuous circles that are the nature of ecological relationships that 
allow them to survive even under conditions of normal extremity, which we experience in this country. The, a recent analysis of the current state of the environment in Australia, the State of the Environment report that finally came out a couple of months ago, showed that of the 19 ecosystems spanning Australia's land, seas um, and terrestrial Antarctic territory, 18 of those ecosystems are at risk of collapse. So this is not something that's on the edge of what's happening. Um, as a result of the changed land use over the last two centuries, Australia has the highest uh, soil organic, organic soil loss after the US and China, soil being the absolute foundation of all sustainable life. In the past two centuries, Australia has lost more mammal species than any other continent. More than 100 Australian mammals are listed as extinct or extinct in the wild. And of course, the actual number is going to be much higher than that because of the limits of our knowledge. More than 1,900 Australian species and ecological communities are known to be at risk of extinction or threatened. Uh, if we just talk about koalas, since 1999, the destruction of koala habitats um, has increased. Uh, since the EP, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act came in every single year, more koala habitat has been destroyed than was destroyed in the last year. Um, and in New South Wales, shortly before the bushfires in 2019, um, a report found that since 2016, when New South Wales uh, massively ramped up the neoliberalism of conservation and biodiversity protection, there was an increase by 13-fold of land clearing. Um, and just a few months before the fires, and I'm going to come back to this when I say a little bit about the definition of ecocide that's been proposed, the New South Wales government announced that farmers who had cleared land illegally even though that we know so much land clearing is legal, those who had cleared it illegally were going to be given an amnesty. So this is the political environment that we're in. Even after the black some of the, the fossil fuel black summer fires uh, killed an estimated 64,000 koalas um, and significant proportions of koala habitat, like 80% of koala habitat in the Blue Mountains, uh, the legislative and regulatory regime has stopped, um, has, has failed to stop the further destruction of koala habitat, for example, in uh, southwestern, in south western Sydney. So what I'm trying to get across is this notion that ecocide is somehow that we're in this normal space and then there's a threshold that is somehow out there above where we are that we need to enact criminal law just completely fails to describe the actual situation that we're in. And I, and I think that really asks something about this. So I wanted to say uh, a few words about multi-species justice, which is the framework that we have come to bring to thinking about uh, justice, that multi-species justice insists the, the exclusion of beings other than humans as subject of justice is both unethical and irrational. Unethical because the myriad bases of uh, the exclusion of beings other than humans from the circle of moral consideration, uh, from not being made in the image of God, to not having feelings, to not having language, to not having the capacity to conceptualise their own deaths, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the more we find out about other beings and not just other animals, but also trees and soils, the more we understand that these bases of exclusion actually don't hold as a firm line between the human and the more than human, but irrational because if the pandemic that we're still living in has taught us anything, there is no possibility of talking about human flourishing or human justice without talking about the flourishing and justice for the more than human world. So uh, even if the bases of separation could be justified, which they can't be, in fact, when we see what happens, when we systematically treat the more than human world as resource for extraction and exploitation, is the end of the, of the possibility of human flourishing. 
and the existing environmental laws and animal protection laws that we have completely fail to embrace anything like the ethic of multi-species justice because those protections that are afforded uh, continue to adopt a utilitarian logic in which beings other than humans are ultimately defeasible and highly discountable side constraints on human action. And, and I think that carries through into the way that we've thought about ecocide law, at least the, the definition that has been offered up. So I want to turn to that definition now and just focus on a particular part of it. And I know that Rob is going to talk about this as well, but I just want to focus on the unlawful and the wanton part of that definition. So uh, to define ecocide as uh, destructive acts that are unlawful is kind of behind the point, beside the point, because the whole point is that we live within legal systems where the destruction of beings other than humans and ecological systems occurs uh, not only under the colour of law, but also is completely normalised within our economic and political systems. So I want to focus then on wanton, which is defined in the proposed definition as quite reckless disregard for damage, which would be clearly excessive in relation to social and economic benefits anticipated. In other words, and I know that um, Jojo Meta disagrees with this interpretation or this argument that Tony and I have put forward, but I put it forward nevertheless. In other words, it means that ecocidal damage is okay so long as it brings certain humans certain benefits. Um, the panel says that socially beneficial acts might include building housing developments and transport links. Uh, now, Tony's going to go on to talk about the kind of anthropocentric get out of jail free framing that is consistent. Well, I think you are, Tony, consistent with, uh, with the frameworks of, of international environmental law that we've got. But if, if, we, if we take seriously this, no, this notion that ecocide is going to be introduced as a fifth crime, uh, for the purposes of the International Criminal Court. Let's actually look at the logic that is brought to bear with these gravest of all crimes. Now, there's a notion in international law that the gravest international crimes like genocide, like torture, are non-derogable, which means that there are no excuses. So if I quote from the Convention Against Torture, it says no exceptional circumstances whatsoever, whether a state of war or a threat of war, internal political instability or any other political public emergency may be invoked to justify torture. So I think we need to ask serious questions about why is there justifications for ecocide, but we have a basic principle of international law that these gravest of crimes are not justifiable under it any circumstances, what does that say about the way in which this logic of utilitarian, defeasible side constraints of destruction of the more than human actually carries through into the proposed definition of ecocide? Now, that, and, and I'm going to finish with this, this raises very, very difficult strategic and political questions for us. And I appreciate and I understand the arguments that are made that unless these very significant compromises, very significant ethical compromises are made in the proposed definition, we haven't got a hope in hell of getting acceptance of the definition of ecocide or the crime of ecocide uh, in the Rome Statute. Um, but... Given what we know about the actual effectiveness of prosecutions under the Rome Statute, I would actually argue that the purposes of the law is more expressive and performative than it is going to as a basis of actual prosecutions. And I think that there are very high costs in adopting a definition which basically continues to accept the logic of discounting. So then it raises the question, and I think this touches on the final remarks uh, 
that, um, that Gwyn was making is what do we do in Australia? Do we try and encode within mainstream law, which is going to involve massive compromises given the nature of the Australian state, notwithstanding the, the change of government, of course, we're talking about state governments, or do we actually take this much more as a people's movement, much more in terms of people's tribunals, much more in terms of social movements and recognise that uh, this track of legal reform under the type of conditions of crisis, emergency and mass murder, frankly, that we're in uh, really isn't appropriate to the nature of the crime. And I'll finish there. Thanks, Danielle. <clears throat> Very powerful. Really appreciate that. And hopefully people can hear the, the different... Um, the different concepts of how other people are defining ecocide and what that means for us as we grapple with taking further action. At the moment, there's no settled deciding activity to go forward in Australia around a particular definition because we're grappling with that even just as a, a working group. So, And I know Rob's got a lot more to share on that. Um, now, if anyone's got a quick burning question for Danielle, please do let me know right now um, before she ducks off. And if you don't, that's totally fine. We'll take questions for her later. I think, a lot of I think there's a question there. Is it Zoll? I can see. Um, oh, hand up. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you can unmute if you've got a quick question, Zoll. Uh, you can unmute if you'd like to ask a quick question. Yeah. Uh, Danielle, your paper, everyone else's paper is stunning. I thank you so much for your passion. I would like to know, um, as a writer, a reader, I would like to know, have you written anything that I can read <laughs> so that I can, I can um, get it? Uh, I, don't, I don't want what you've just said to disappear into some sort of past memory. Uh, thank you, so. So uh, having lived through the Black Summer fires in a multi-species community, I wrote a book about that called Summertime. Uh, reflections on a vanishing future. So that's probably a good place to start, but thank you for asking. And and also, Danielle, didn't you and um, Anthony publish a, uh, was it a conversation piece and an article about yeah. ecocide? I'm, I'm just going to drop the link in the chat. Thank you. Great that idea. Yeah, yeah, Tony and I wrote a piece in the conversation which expanded that critique on ecocide. Yeah, yeah that's terrific. Sorry. Sorry, can you repeat the name of that title? I ran out of uh, out of memory before I got to the end of the title. I can put it in chat. Yeah, the book is called Summertime. Yep. And her name is on the on her square right there under her face. But okay. Christine and I will make sure we write it in the chat as well. Okay, good one. Thank you, Zoll. And thank you for sharing, Danielle. All right, we might. And thank you. Thank you. I can see Anthony's popping those links in. Please do look them up. Really important stuff. Thank you, Danielle. And do jump off whenever you have to. No need to explain. Um, thanks for your time today. Over Thank to you, me. Rob, to um, to share with us some other views. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the First Nations people of Lutruwita, Tasmania, uh, the Palawa people, and I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I suppose, and I, I, I've got so much to say, but we don't have time for everything to be said. But I think my starting point is, what is the goal? What's the point? So there are three key questions that underpin my presentation, although I don't do this explicitly. What's the goal or the mission of what we're trying to achieve? What are the mechanisms, for example, laws and activism? And what are the operational aspects of trying to put into place something like an ecocide. So how do we institutionalize the thing that we're talking about? Um, but I'm gonna start with the, the idea of ecocentrism because that's my starting point. Uh, I'm not gonna read the slides and you can get the sense of the slides, but I'm not gonna go into the details of the slides. I'm happy for those to be made available to people. Um, but basically I start from the premise of ecocentrism, which views the environment as having value for its own sake, uh, not simply for instrumental or utilitarian value to humans. So that's the baseline sort of value or principle that I start with. 
and then ask the question, okay, how does that translate into a justice framework? And certainly in the kind of work that we've done in the area of green criminology, we talk about three types of justice, environmental justice dealing with humans, ecological justice dealing with specific ecosystems, and species justice um, dealing with non-human animals and with plants, particularly from the point of view, increasingly, of biodiversity. So valuing nature and the environment in its own right, translating that into a justice framework, which has these kinds of dimensions. And then we can start asking the question of what is ecocide and how does it relate? How does eco-justice in fact relate to ecocide? I think we have to distinguish different senses of the word in the term ecocide. It's been long used as simply a description, a description of major harm to the environment, however that's defined. So in this descriptive sense, it refers to material harms to specific territories and indeed to the earth as a whole. Um, in this sense, it's more of an analytical term. It's based on science uh, and, and knowledge of various kinds. So when I say scientific, I, I'm being inclusive in this particular instance of indigenous science and technology. Um, and basically as a descriptive term ecocide, uh, we can show the key harms and the key harms basically, and we've known this now for many years, are global warming, which translates into climate change and climate disruption, diminishment of biodiversity, which is plants and animals, and pollution and contamination of our air, land, and water. This is ecocide. This is happening. Uh, we don't need a law to tell us this, but we do need the science and the knowledge. We also have ecocide as an international crime. This is where we shift the meaning into a legal prescription and the philosophical basis of the term here is related to notions of harm, rights, and duty of care. Um, duty of care doesn't necessarily translate into the rights of nature, but it does mean a duty of care on the part of humans to nature. Um, this is also aspirational, so it's not descriptive, it's aspirational, it's saying we want law reform of some kind, either international or domestic or both. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the Stop Ecocide International proposed definition, um, but basically that's an, that's an example of a legal prescription. So ecocide as a, as a crime. A third sense of ecocide is tying it into the notion of eco-justice, which is where we started. So in this notion of ecocide, harm should be based on a broad ecocentric criteria. Accountability, and I'll come back to this a bit later, is expressed as strict liability. That is no excuses, no excuses. Um, in, indeed, absolute liability, but that's problematic, but we'll, perhaps that's getting into the peculiarities and detail of the law. A key point is that the victims of ecocide have to include the non-human, and the mission, ultimately, of having ecocide as eco-justice is to provide for good environmental outcomes. Uh, so we need to talk about valuing processes of valuing in terms of intrinsic value, totality, so everything's interconnected. So ecological interrelationships and remediation, that is preventing and repairing harm. So that's ecocide in its various senses. The problem is this, that the most ecocidal tendency in the world today is climate change. And here's what the science says. The problem's global warming. We know from the science how to contain global warming. And we have a number of uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change reports dealing with mitigation strategies, that is dealing with the causes of climate change and adaptation strategies, that is dealing with the consequences. So the question is, how come we're not doing anything, right? We know the urgency of the problem, again, from the science. You can just read, pick up a newspaper almost any day. So the political challenge is how do we get to where the science says that we need to get? This is ecocide on a global scale. So ultimately, we're talking about politics. And I'll come back to why ecocide becomes part of the political endeavor in a moment. But rapid political shifts are indeed possible. And again, I'm not gonna read the slide, but we know that during the global financial crisis, governments around the world moved really quickly to do a whole bunch of stuff, which they then, had, they, they took stuff, uh, they, they socialized the losses to capital, to private capital, and then basically they gave back everything to the private capitalists after the crisis had passed. But we do have a form of de facto 
nationalization of banks, for example, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the pandemic has shown that even very conservative governments like in Australia can do adopt basically a Keynesian policy of spend, spend, spend. Um, uh, so they had to get rid of the old mugs uh, because it was now a spending government rather than a, a government of restraint. And of course, war. We know that we can take the money off the billionaires because we just did it with some of the Russian billionaires. Not, And of course, in some countries, they gave a month's notice so that they could squirrel the money away. Um, nonetheless, we know that rapid political shifts are possible. So to cut to the chase, we've got an issue of structural authoritarianism that is the key decisions of our economy are in the hands of, of the private hands of basically billionaires. And the fact that we can name them by name is indicative of the concentration of power. So we need a, a transformational nationalization that takes private capital that owns and controls these, these crucial economic levers and put them into public hands. Governance must be public, open, cooperative, and democratic, uh, and so on. But basically, we have to reinforce the importance of public ownership and public interest. Secondly, we have to ensure that there's democracy and democratic processes are protected. Uh, these are being attacked worldwide everywhere. Various types of political authoritarianism accompanying the structural authoritarianism of the billionaires is political authoritarianism where the reduction of rights, and I'm not, again, I'm not gonna read the slide, but basically we do need uh, pre preferential voting systems, independent electoral commissions and so on. Uh, and of course we have to break up the media monopolies. The third thing is to tackle through law uh, issues surrounding public interest in ecological justice. And here, what we have to do is see ecocide and Gwen finished her talk along these lines as well, that we, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff, moving parts that we have to talk about. Again, I'm not gonna read the slide in depth, but we do have to talk about the rights of nature and how we think about that. Um, we have to talk about duties of care in Victoria. Now they have a general environmental duty of care in relation to, to waste and pollution offenses. Um, we have to talk about specific climate laws. We can talk about climate litigation and the importance of that in terms of forcing companies and governments to, to do better than they are. And then of course there's ecocide as a crime. Now the, in, the importance of ecocide as a crime is partly symbolic and it is still very much aspirational. But it places attention, if we construct it the right way, on where it needs to be put. And here's an example, corporate culpability. We know that basically the destruction of the planet is due to transnational corporations in cahoots with governments at all levels, state, federal, and local. And so what we need to do is, is ensure that when the harms are perpetrated by, by businesses and by governments and states, that we can hold them to account. Therefore, we need some kind of strict liability regime that says it's the, the seriousness of the harm that counts. It's not what you think, because if you're dealing with non-human entities like corporations destroying non-human entities like rivers, um, basically you're, you're in a big conundrum. So let's cut out the mental element. That comes back in at sentencing anyway. And it comes back in when you talk about uh, aggravating and mitigating factors. So there's gonna be a mental element, but let's make sure that we stop the seriousness, stop the crime from occurring. So what are the challenges? And here's a strategic input. It, can, we can talk about the institutional operationalization of ecocide because strategically that takes us forward, I think. It's, it's basically saying that yes, it's a political struggle. So let's politicize how it might be institutionalized. So things like, ecocide as a principle of adjudication. We have various principles guiding environmental laws and so on that talk about the key elements of ecological sustainable development. The precautionary principle, for example, pollution pays principle and so on. Let's add ecocide as a principle of adjudication related to ecological sustainable development. We need to talk about issues of thresholds and proportionality. Um, what, how do we assess the seriousness of harm and, and relate that to the quantum of sanction? Uh, we also, as part of that process, need to ascertain when harm or risk of harm has, has occurred and occurring. So therefore we have to develop a language around the scientific and legal indicia or indicators of harm. Um, and again, I'm using scientific in this sense uh, to incorporate indigenous science and technology. And of course we have to, at the end of the day, 
talk about what's the point. We want to repair the harm and maximize a good environmental outcome. Uh, part of what underpins a lot, large part of this slide is that if you want to operationalize ecocide, uh, then you need specialist courts. You need specialists working in the legal domain, specialist lawyers, prosecutors, and judges, and indeed specialist courts. That extends to the international level as well as the national and the domestic level or local level, I should say. So at the end of the day, ecocide's about politics. We use it to condemn those who destroy the environment. We use it to push for institutional change that will hold those destroyers of the environment to account. That's the point, and it's entirely political from, the, from go to woe. Well. So there are some thoughts. I've got other thoughts uh, across in more detail about things like the limitations of the International Criminal Court and a variety of other things. But basically, I think that's enough for the moment. So thank you very much. And Excellent. Thank you so much, Rob. And I know you have so much more to say. And um, if we didn't make it clear, and I apologize, I think Quinn's the only one who mentioned it and Christina and I didn't, but we do have this very strong working group uh, looking at ecocide laws in Australia. And we're super keen um, for others who are interested or want to contribute or want to share what we produce as examples of ways forward. So um, thank you so much, Rob. Last but not least, thank you so much for your um, patience. Uh, Anthony, we're looking forward to your talk. You're going to bring it all home for us. Um, Anthony Burke, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. No pressure. Um, I am in Kudri today, ahead of a meeting on the new global framework for biodiversity at UNSW tomorrow. And UNSW generally is on the unceded territory of the Bedigal, Gadigal peoples of um, Sydney and the Ngunnawal people in Canberra. And I acknowledge their elders past and present and that sovereignty has never been ceded. So I was asked to talk about options for Australia. Now, that's a very big question, um, but I take it to mean spend some time discussing the possible pathways to the adoption of an ecocide law in Australia. And I want to raise, raise that in relation to the value of the ecocide concept, um, the high level panel definition as well, in relation to the biodiversity and extinction crises that we face in this country that Danny laid out so eloquently. And I think obviously many of, many of you have started doing this work, um, but there's a kind of legal pathway that can be researched and discussed and, and further worked on around what kind of potential legal precedents we might find in Australian law, in Australian courts, international, in, in other countries as well, and how they are evolving or might further evolve. But I'm not going to discuss that so much as a kind of values and advocacy and reform pathway. Um, and I think the values question, which Danny has really touched on and told us more about, and Rob as well, is, is a really crucial one here. Are we going to prioritise the human interest and the human developmental economic interest over the interests of ecosystems and more than human beings? Um, and can those competing interests be reconciled? Or does our understanding of the human interest really need to change. Um, and I also want to, so there's a kind of tension here that we need to work with or work around. One is around what's the relationship between domestic and international law in regards to biodiversity. And then tensions between competing norms in international environmental law. And I think I want to raise just in a couple of minutes, a question about what our purpose for ecocide is, if it's a threshold crime, um, as Gwyn argues, that talks about an extreme of harm. What's the, the relationship of that kind of crime 
and advocating around that versus the purposes of domestic and international biodiversity law, which is increasingly about protect, prevent and restore um, damage to biodiversity. But think, think about where we are now in Australia makes me think of that old Irish joke about a tourist who asked somebody in the country who uh, for directions to Dublin and they, they reply, well, sir, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. And, um, and that problem lies in both Australian law and international law. So internationally, we have the Convention on Biodiver Biological Diversity it has core obligations to protect and preserve biodiversity, but that coexists with the international customary law principle of permanent sovereignty over natural resources, which gives all states widespread freedoms to exploit and damage ecosystems with relative impunity. Um, and that tension is at the heart of the convention. We also know that the convention has very little accountability. And this is a problem that is not gonna be solved in the drafts of the new post 2020 global biodiversity framework that we've, we've seen. Then in Australia, we have obviously a major challenge with the Environmental Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act, which has been identified by the Samuels Review. And we have inconsistent state lawmaking on forests, on, on forestry, on land use, on development approvals um, that is putting ecosystems in danger and licensing all kinds of damage. We, as Danny mentioned, you know, we're listed as a global deforestation hotspot. We have so many species at risk, yet our, you know, we barely have um, you know, protection plans for most of our endangered species. So we are not starting from a good place at the moment, but that makes the, the eco side conversation doubly important. Um, so I don't think we should feel any more or less um, despondent because we have to start where we are. And I think this is, and you know, the, the other issue, I suppose, is a kind of neoliberal culture of governance that we've developed in this country over the last 30 years, where we trust markets to solve profound governance and regulatory problems. Most recently is the discussion around the new proposed um, biodiversity credit market and the concerns that, like the problem we've got in New South Wales is that they would become used as biodiversity offsets for development. And we know that that market has enormous kind of moral and integrity problems. So th there's a domestic reform agenda that, that we face there. And my view is that we need both an ecocide law that stands as a kind of threshold, a normative standard, a kind of cap on domestic law, but we're going to need a domestic reform program that prohibits development and land use that has serious adverse effects on wildlife, forests and ecosystems at thresholds well below those set out by the high level panel on ecocide. Um, now, Against that somewhat grim picture, what was interesting is that at the COP26, there was the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use that was signed by hundreds of states and committed them to working collectively to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030, while delivering sustainable development and inclusive rural transformation. Um, now, that's not a whole biodiversity statement, but it is very important because we know forest and habitat are crucial. And Australia signed this document. It 
It's a kind of performative declaratory document. It doesn't have any teeth, but it, it sets out a really important global goal and standard. And Australia has signed it. The Morrison government signed it. Um, so that is something we can consider and work off. So I'm thinking around ecocide in Australia, I like the high level panel definition apart from the, the problem with the lawful and wanton provisions. I think it's thresholds of what is severe and or widespread or long-term are well set out and they, they form a really solid basis for domestic lawmaking in this space. Um, and the argument, what, what I found encouraging was they adhered to a test that we're calling ecological stringency, which is a fidelity to what is actually occurring in ecosystems and a fundamental commitment to their integrity and flourishing. Um, in a sense, the definitions work on what you could call ecological facts, you know, it refers to the earth, its biosphere, cryosphere, um, grave impacts on human life or natural, cultural or economic resources. So the definition can be tested and, ex and expounded and explored scientifically. Um, but there is an ecocentric suite of values that must go along with it. So that's the approach we should be taking. Um, the other interesting discussion we've had in the last few years is around climate triggers as well, whether it's in the EPPC Act or state government acts. And I think they're important because they remind us that we're making law in relation to not merely Australian jurisdictions, but the entirety of the biosphere and the climate system. So just to conclude, my key point, I think discussion and advocacy around ecocide and legislating it will be important for Australia, but I also think that we need to be working more broadly, broadly and immediately to reform biodiversity governance and development approval processes in this ecologically stringent way. So yes, start by implementing the Samuels Review but don't stop there because we know the problem is, is much more profound. And the concern here about just pushing ecocide by itself is that while it's valuable, it aims at criminalizing damage that is extreme in nature. It has most force after the fact. And what we need is a process that has a preventative power as well. An ecocide law will have that preventative power, but it will be too slow according to the timelines of the current crisis. So let's work as well to align it with campaigns and programs for a truly federal system that protects and restores biodiversity in line with the new global biodiversity framework and the Glasgow Declaration on, on Forests and Land Use. Um, and then ecocide can be seen as a kind of overarching or anchoring structure um, that prescribes a really powerful set of norms. But we're going to need the law to protect and restore ecosystems before they're damaged as well. Thanks. Oh, no, just wanted to say hi to Zoll. <laughs> Everyone to seems to say hello to Zoll. <laughs> we, we used to work. I can't help being a superstar in and glamorous. Movement. What's that? We we work together in the nuclear free and independent Pacific movement. On oh, the FIP. Twenty odd years ago. Ah. So, where were we, we based at the time? Sydney. Oh right. Yes, I run the office here. Yes. All right. Okay. Anyway. Thanks so All much. Right. No, yeah. thank you, Anthony. Um. <laughs> So we've got a couple of questions in the chat and some of them we've sort of touched on answering, but I'm going to run through them again. Um, but if anyone has other questions, please do pop them into the chat now. Um, we've got about 30 minutes, actually. Um, we're scheduled to finish it just before two. Uh, so we do have time for some good discussion. So just bear with me and I'm just going to open up the collated questions again. 
and I'm I'm going to put them to the panel and if I've got thoughts I'll share but if anyone if you just unmute and share please none of them will be for anyone in particular so the first question was um how close are we in getting ecocide laws introduced in Australia I briefly put into the chat um that there is there are no proposals at the moment in front of any parliaments or any politicians that we're aware of um, but this working group is keen to start pushing different ideas into different groups. But Rob or Gwyn or Anthony, did you want to make any comments about that? Okay. <laughs> you don't have to. You can just shake your um, head. That's fine. We've got heaps of questions to go on. Well, I think we have to, in a sense, think about ecocide and laws relating to ecocide very um, laterally and creatively. Uh, for example, if we slightly rephrase the question, are there any laws or legal judgments today that are challenging the prevailing ability of businesses to engage in ecocide, then we can say there's actually quite interesting developments happening, particularly with the New South Wales Land and Environment Court. Um, their judgment, I think it was the, the Gloucester case where they, they judge, um, Chief Judge Brian Preston uh, incorporated uh, the effects of expanding a, a coal mine, uh, the effects on climate change uh, is really a step forward. And, and that's and part of the rationale, if you actually distill it down, is that we don't want to stop up the planet. Um, so that's part of the mission of the ecocide laws anyway, uh, is that we're, we're trying to prevent and stop stuff. So I think we, we can be, we, we need to sort of look at a variety of ways in which the fight against ecocide is manifesting uh, in case law, uh, not so much in legislation perhaps so far, but certainly in case law. Um, the other thing that we need in, to look at is, uh, is the criminal offenses embedded in environmental laws. So um, ecocide does not necessarily have to reside only in criminal laws, which can be a bit difficult um, and, and so on. But there, already we can see that there's potentially ways that we can embed at least some of the key concerns of ecocide in existing criminal laws that have, uh, sorry, it, in, embedded in environmental laws that have criminal provisions. Um, so I think there's, it's a fancy way of saying there's more than one way to skin, skin the cat. Um, but I think that it's the mission that counts and what we're trying to achieve ultimately that counts. Thanks, Rob. I think that's an excellent answer because you've elaborated beyond just the simple framing of ecocide. Um, and the Gloucester case with Judge Preston was um, very important. And hopefully we're seeing other people question um, and challenge within the realm of existing law, the extent of harm. And although we have other questions, I would like to jump to the question um, that Claire has put. And I'd love the thoughts from this group, because as she said, um, the climate emergency is the most important threat we're facing on this planet. We had the climate change election, yet it's very disappointing that the Albanese government are going ahead with massive oil and gas projects. Any comments, please? And can I say, you know, I find it profoundly disturbing um, that that's what's continuing. Some people say, oh, they have to do a stepwise approach to move away from fossil fuels. Um, I just think, I mean, as uh, Danielle's evidence rattling off, the harm that's being caused across just this continent. Um, there's no excuse. They should be investing in phasing out. To me, there's just no excuse. It was a climate change election. They should be looking at the, if they wanna play economic games, then do the economic analysis of how much it's gonna to cost to transition from fossil fuels into other industries. Civil society's ready for it. There have been so many transformation, just transition, new economy networks for so long. Everybody's ready for that transition. That's my little rant. Anyone else want to add to that? Oh, thanks, Michelle. I was just, um, I, I would just add to that that <clears throat> that um, Australian companies and the Australian government are on notice, um, and they can't be unaware of of what these these issues are or how they sit within the the global. Um, debate um, in terms of reliance on fossil fuels, um, oil and gas. Um, but um, I would just also, as, as a side note, and, I, and I, I do come to this from 
a very sort of, I suppose I'm imprisoned by the, the sort of the, the legal mindset. Um, and that, that would be to caution um, not to take a law like ecocide and, um, and expect too much from it. Um, you, it's, it's not a panacea, it's only um, a worst case, um, last resort type of, of, of a crime. Um, and below that, there are so many other, as, as Rob said, so many other responses, um, including embedding ecocide as a, as a legal principle for adjudication. And I really do, do support uh, Rob on that. Um, and, and in that way, uh, you can see that coming through um, domestic courts in Australia, through the Land and Environment Court, using those um, principles, um, you know, at, at, at um, uh, you know, in, it, in, its, in its judgments. Um, and as well, I mean, we're working on many, many fronts. Also, um, the work of people's tribunals, I think, also have discussions that, that um, laws and, and courts can't, can't have um, and, you know, allow that discourse to facilitate that discourse that, um, so we're about many, many different approaches, but I think um, not to expect that ecocide's going, going to, um, you know, be able to respond to all the ch environmental challenges that we, we face. Mm. Thanks, Gwyn. Really great point, actually. Okay, another question. Um, can I can I just oh. jump in on there? Yes, just, please. To say that yeah. we're in the midst of a climate emergency, um, and what's happening is that we are still subsidising the fossil fuel industries worldwide to the tune of billions of dollars a year, of which many billions come within Australia, um, and that's been acknowledged by the the, um, the head of the UN, amongst other people, um, and. Simultaneously, whilst we're stuffing up the environment, um, worldwide, they're passing regressive anti-protesting laws. And, and we have to see that this is part of the political struggle so that, so that the struggle that we have ahead of us is not only to put in place laws relating to ecocide, but we also have to defend our democratic rights. And that's why in one of the slides I put forward, I talked about um, political authoritarianism and an aspect of that political authoritarianism is the anti-protest laws. Uh, now, where this come, the chickens come home to roost for me is that one way to respond to the Labor government uh, is to go to the companies and, and protest against the companies, the Adani Corporation's an obvious one, but amongst many nefarious organizations. We've got a lot to learn from the fight against guns, uh, limited here in Tassie, uh, which was highly successful. We stopped the, the introduction of new pulp mill, but it's because it was multi-pronged and international in scope and really hit the company where it hurt. Um, and I think that part of what we have to do is in a sense, step a, around the government um, and, and try and hit the companies where they hurt as much as we can, as well as putting pressure on governments that are obviously doing the wrong thing. Yes, Anthony, thanks Rob. Um, yeah, just a quick point, I think, Gwyn's caution about how much use ecocide is in the climate context is well made. Um, I think you could, when you look at the impact of global heating on the oceans, on coral reefs and on ocean acidification, you can establish that it is causing ecocidal damage. Now, establishing liability against one particular polluter is obviously legally tricky, but the the, the stat, you can also use ecocide as a as a norm as a as a concept as a moral statement and I think in that case it is useful perhaps to talk about um, new fossil fuel projects especially now that we've already passed 1.2 C of warming is um, is worth doing thanks Anthony um, we've got a couple of different questions. We've, I might group a few around the sort of the political aspects, um, but in the, there's also a question here about employees of guilty corporations may recognise that what they're doing is damaging to the environment. Can we anticipate people resigning and corporations having trouble recruiting 
Um, there was actually a good comment in the chat, um, but I think it's fair to say that um, many of the corporate uh, activities around so-called corporate social responsibility or CSR, where they try to get employees to love them even more by doing volunteer programs, by having foundations, by donating, is in deep recognition that they, they know this, many of their staff want to work in a place that they're proud of. Um, we, we, even inside AILA, are certainly aware of people who resign from companies and government when their values are not being um, supported or they don't see an alignment. So I think even anecdotal evidence says yes, but does anyone else have any thoughts on that? The, the kind of the turning away from corporations known to be dodgy? Yes, Gwyn. Uh, um, I would say, Michelle, that without criminal law, um, you are you are left with only civil law, and um, we know that um, that that corporations um, settle and they never see the inside of a courtroom. So if you don't have crime, um, you don't have um, you you don't have the you don't shift the debate from. Uh, uh, from the, the the civil jurisdiction to to the criminal jurisdiction, so um, uh, so you won't see um, uh, corporations or anybody resigning until they actually start to feel the pinch, um, you know. And uh, yeah, so they they um, uh, they big corporations see environment, they externalize um, the fines, the, um, the implications of doing business, um, and, and they're able to do that. They can settle out of court, but until you, you get that line in the sand, uh, I don't think you're going to get um, uh, any re repercussions as such. That's, that's just my view. Thanks, Quinn. Rob, any thoughts or happy to keep going? Uh, I, I think it's a drop in the bucket. I don't think it matters or counts very much at all. And I think that the companies, if they really felt somebody was that green or that activist or that environmentally minded, wouldn't mind seeing the, the end of them anyway. Um, it's a drop in the bucket. Uh, what we need is structural change and, and change to the power relations that allow that corporation to do what it's doing. Uh, that's not gonna come from resignations, that's going to come from uh, standing up to the corporations um, through a variety of different kinds of actions. Um, and certainly uh, economic action is part of that. So boycotts and also uh, with the guns case, uh, it was quite successful when they, when Australian activists joined up with Japanese activists um, to, the, to the purchasing companies in Japan and basically put pressure on the companies in Japan to stop buying wood chips from, or, or to supporting guns as a, as a logging company in Australia. So there's, there's strategic ways to do stuff. I, I think leaving a company doesn't really do a lot in, in my books. Can I just add, Michelle, too, there's a, you know, examples of the Environmental Defenders Office um, looking at um, big super companies um, like Uni, Uni Super for greenwashing. Um, and that affects their social license as well. So there's there's many different um, uh, ways of, of of. Sorry, I think I might have dropped out. Uh, apologies. Um, all right, another great question here. Um, there was one here about has any political party indicated any interest in ecocide laws introduction? Um, I mentioned uh, that David Shoebridge had been making public comments about. Um, ecocide recently. I don't know if anyone on our panel wants to comment on that. And Lyndon, who's on this call um, and is engaged in um, advocacy for the recognition of ecocide as a law, pointed out that two um, Greens politicians, uh, Larissa Waters, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten already, somebody else have signed up to, you know, declare themselves supporting um, ecocide laws at that international level. But does the panel have any other thoughts? Um, interactions, comments about what political parties in Australia may or often may not be interested in. I mean, obviously Labor is a tricky question, but the Labor Environmental Action Network might be an, an interesting kind of way in to engage them on the ecocide concept and the high level panels work on the crisis. I think they've certainly been pushing on the biodiversity 
EPBC side. Um, so that might be an interesting set of conversations to have. Mm. Thanks, Anthony. Um, a question here, uh, which type of ecocide laws would be the easiest to bring in? I mentioned in the chat to this question, and thanks for the question, um, that at its most basic level, integrating ecocide into existing criminal laws would be the easiest way to do it if you had the political will. But Gwyn, in particular, did you want to talk a bit more about, you know, theoretically, if we had um, a state government interested in at, uh, recognising ecocide as a crime, um, what, what do you think would be the easiest or quickest way to do that? Thanks, Michelle. I, I, I think um, even to have the debate, even if there's not the political will, that um, uh, to, to find, um, uh, you know, particularly courageous politicians who are even prepared to put the debate up in politics is a useful exercise in and of itself. Um, even if that means getting a draft bill up um, and then, you know, having that that um, debate. Um, uh, so yeah, I would say um, it's 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 very it's a very useful uh, law reform tool. Even if if that bill then gets referred to um, a law reform commission to um, to be able to analyze the the implications of it. Um, and it's quite often the way that that uh, laws get reformed is that you introduce a bill. Um, a member of parliament, you know, in, introduces that into the parliament. Um, and if they see it as being too, too hot a political issue, that they can refer it off to, to um, law reform committees so that, um, you know, they can um, analyze the, the in, ins and outs of it, you know. Um, Thanks. But, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and I, I really want to acknowledge Diane Evers is on this call and she's put in the uh, note there that she introduced really Australia's first state level rights of nature bill. Um, I think it's two years ago now. We both did not really expect it to get up, but by introducing it and raising that conversation, that was really excellent. In Australia, rights of nature laws are complex to think about and to implement because we're a colonial country and there's a lot of aspects to that. Um, and if anyone's interested in it, um, there's going to be um, about three different groups that involve Indigenous and non-Indigenous folks who are now looking at trying to advocate for the equivalent of a rights of nature or law of obligation in Australia around their rivers and other places. If anybody's interested, please just shoot us a note at AILA. Um, we'd love to keep folks informed about uh, the work. Um, our job is to support communities and others when they want to step up. Um, as we did with Diane and her excellent work getting this up on the radar in a place like Western Australia, which was totally brilliant to have that conversation. And do remember that um, that was actually before and, and helped catalyze discussions and support. The Blue Mountains City Council is the first council in Australia to adopt rights of nature as an operational principle. It's nothing like having a law, but it's connected to their planetary health work and showing their deep commitment to trying to move towards an appropriate ecocentric framework. So. There's lots of really, um, as Gwyn said, there's ways to showcase, to raise the idea. I know we're in an absolute emergency, um, but trying sort of any approach to get this stuff into the conversations, into the discourse, into the news, that starts to build that swell of, well, maybe this is an idea we can do something with. Um, and certainly we'll come back to it. There's a really good question from Zol about how we can build people's interest around a movement, but we might come to that in a moment. Um, uh, there's a question here. I'm not sure if it's a question or just a comment. Do we need citizen lawyers to enhance citizen science scientists? I would say sort of yes. We definitely need more uh, loud, loud voices to enhance citizen scientists. And we need more people engaging in and democratizing what law is, how it works, and how we change it. Um, and that's, again, something that Ayla does an awful lot of talking to people about why environmental laws aren't as good as they could be because they weren't built the way we think they should be. Um, but lots of people pushing for the good stuff is important. Um, but does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Gwyn. Um, sorry, I would just say um, I've seen an example with the um, Monsanto, International Monsanto Tribunal where there was an attempt to um, to prosecute the crime, the potential crime of ecocide. Um, and in that, that context, 
um, one of the things that became obvious is that different professionals work on different um, uh, 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 senses of, of certainty. Um, like in, in criminal law, there's the requirement for beyond reasonable doubt. Um, and that's what we're up against if we get a crime of eco side up. Um, but scientists talk about possibilities or probabilities or likelihoods. And in that way, you get a real tension um, if you're trying to prosecute these things between, between different uh, professional input. Um, that, uh, that so, and, and between that falls the, the argument that, um, uh, that ecosystems are capable of repairing themselves. And how do we know that an ecosystem, at, 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 if we look at it at a particular cross section, whether this the ecosystem is capable of um, repairing itself and renewing and uh, is this permanent damage? And all the, the types of issues that um, lawyers have field days with. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I, I would think we all need to educate each other, the scientists and the lawyers, and you know, in a really kind of holistic and um, uh, and interdisciplinary type of approach. Mm. Excellent, thank you, Gwyn. Um, I'm going to go to two questions that are linked and they're actually from Zoll. Um, she says she'd like to hear more about how we can use existing laws. Um, and I think we've talked a bit about that or how we use existing laws for ecocide. And I think both, well, everyone's spoken really well about some of that. But um, uh, the other question is a really terrific one. How do we get uh, the general public behind ecocide laws as we've discussed today? Um, how do we build, uh, sorry, how to find that O word? How do we build? How do we build momentum? I worry about the legal crackdown on climate protests. Um, absolutely, with a raft of laws that undermine the rights and obligations uh, to protest. But how? Coming back to this movement idea, um, what are our thoughts, folks? Yes, Anthony. Um, I think it's a really important question because I I've said today, you know the the value of the high level panels definition, um, apart from the wantonness test. But that does produce a challenge because I think their, their thinking and their strategy, maybe people can test that with Jojo this evening, was very elitist. It's very much aimed at states about getting something into the a new clause into the Rome Statute in the next decade or so. And the wantonness test was introduced in part. I think there's obviously legal reasoning behind it, but political reasoning about enticing the global south into the conversation. But that disenfranchises communities. And, you know, so I think if we're going to build a movement, we're not going to be, we're, not, we're going to have to avoid sort of passing legal points in a narrow way to thinking about what are the values and the norms underpinning this? Let's push those. Let's get a conversation around those while the kind of legal debate happens, because that happens um, in ways that are, that are not accessible to communities often. Mm, I really agree, um, Anthony, and the idea that how do we get more people involved in discussing these issues locally um, without having to toe the line on an international direction is uh, something that we're very interested in. Yes, Rob. When I started working around ecocide, um, the people who are using the term were in fact scientists like David Suzuki and journalists because they wanted a term that they could use to describe the destruction of the planet. And they thought ecocide, that describes what's happening. So the ones who were reluctant to use it were the lawyers and the criminologists. So it's fascinating. So that the lawyers and the criminologists were, were so caught up with definitional stuff and the, the, the complexities of the concept and the term and, and all this kind of stuff that they didn't want to use the term. Uh, but it was the scientists, the activist scientists like the David Suzuki's and David Attenborough's and so on, who talk about the destruction of the, of the planet as a crime. And they don't give a shit 
uh, whether it's legally defined as a crime, they say it's a crime. And now that resonates. And to me, the power of ecocide as much as anything is its rhetorical value. And I think that part of the difficulty of reducing it to a formula, uh, whatever formula it might be, is that we, 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 we undermine its rhetorical power. And I think that for me, at least, it's the rhetorical power of the term saying, look, this is a crime. Uh, if you're gonna destroy grasslands, that's a bloody crime. If you're gonna destroy the koala habitat, that's a crime. Now, it may not be a crime in law yet, but it's a crime. So I think that I think it's really important that, as I tried to describe, that, that it's used in different ways and we, we need to use it strategically because at the end of the day, it's the mission that counts. Uh, I'd like to segue from that to something else, just as a as a uh, another sort of point. There is a, a crime of ecocide uh, embedded in the International Criminal Court, but it's a crime of ecocide that pertains to to destruction of the environment intentionally during times of war. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is that on the list of those countries that have embedded ecocide as part of uh, domestic law is the Ukraine, and I know that there's now discussions of talking about ecocide against Russia, but, but it's got nothing to do with the domestic definition of ecocide as a crime within peace or against peace. It's got everything to do with ecocide as a crime against war. <laughs> and so we have this weird kind of slippage because what we're talking about here is how do we make the normalized harm to the environment something that's criminal? Mm -hmm. um, but this is where we have to be aware that there's gonna be in a sense, reversals and going back to more narrow definitions of what it means in the context of the Ukraine and so on. So anyway, that's it's because of the politics of it all. Yeah. But no, Rob, you've raised a good point. And just a reminder, I think I forgot to mention it right now in international law, causing ecocide as part of war is a crime. That's the crazy thing. But doing it, as we've all said, as part of day to day activity outside a war environment, it's not a crime. And that's what this international campaign particularly focuses on. Um, but in terms of building a movement, raising the moral issues about ecocide, absolutely using the words, using that framing, um, all of that's important. And someone also had a question about how can we involve unions in this kind of movement? Um, and I guess it would depend on what your purpose is and how you would frame that, because some members of unions might not be interested in challenging their own source of employment as causing ecocide. I think it depends on the context and the people. Uh, Gwyn, you, did you have a comment? No, just to speak to that, um, the um, the work of um, back, back to the work of Polly Higgins and and um, so Polly was work, working on an idea of the conscientious objector um, and around the, this idea that that people were being punished for uh, standing up for the environment. Um, so this speaks to the question of how do you get people involved? She she um, established a trust, um, and you only had to pay a nominal fee into that trust, um, and that um, that you would um, be recognised as being a conscientious objector. That is to say, you are not um, seeking to disrupt business. You are not seek. You have no uh, criminal intent in in. Um, uh, you don't seek to, to damage property, but that you are protesting because uh, you're um, trying to highlight the greater good um, and preventing a much bigger catastrophe. Um, so so um, a number of, of um, uh, individuals signed up to, to trust and, and that argument did go through the courts and was, was ultimately um, successful. I think it was last year sometime uh, where um, but but in that in the case where it was successful the the courts um, suspended the usual um, process and let let the individuals that were on trial for property damage um, let them speak specifically to the jury uh, for the and to explain their their intentions behind their action so in that way it's it's again um, you know educative um, but it's also helping uh, those who want to make those political statements to protect them and reinforce um, their right um, to do so and to conscientiously object. Yeah, thank you. And um, and sort of linking back to that and um, Zoll's question about 
uh, prosecuting protesters and clamping down. I mean, that is a huge and very important issue uh, for environmental and other social justice movements. And we all have to be vigilant trying to argue for maintaining the right to uh, peaceful protest, the right to nonviolent direct action and stuff like that. So it's all interconnected, but so much bigger even than this conversation. Um, now, uh, with the time left, we've got we've got comments, and thank you, Shan Turnbull, for mentioning Polly Higgins again. We did talk about her in the opening remarks about about her work and her definitions, um, and she certainly brought it to the forefront. Um, and you know, those of us who knew her and worked with her loved her dearly. So she's terribly missed. Um, and Jojo Meta may speak this evening um, about the legacy of her work um, and her passing, and how many people stepped in when they realised she was leaving them. Um, so there is a great question here though from um, another Michelle and I did want to mention, I did want to respond to this one. So she, her question is, thinking about citizen engagement in things like science and law, I'm interested in learning more about deliberative structures like people's tribunals, which are new to me. Some of the terms I've come across are collaborative legislation, participatory budgeting, citizens assemblies, policy juries and issue-based deliberative polling. There's so much to explore. And um, I'll ask panelists to comment in a minute, but one thing I wanted to clarify, the People's Tribunal that Gwyn refers to is the Australian People's Tribunal for Community and Nature's Rights. This is just a civil society entity that AILA has created and Gwyn and I and others have been uh, working um, on different aspects of um, how the People's Tribunal can speak up about things. And I can put some more info in the blurb about that. So People's Tribunals are often set up like a mock court where they try such a particular cases and hear them and give alternative uh, decisions to what the state-centred system, like the current legal system and judges might decide. Um, that's quite different from deliberative democracy and citizens' assemblies, and there's a whole body of work around them. Um, and Michelle, if you want to shoot us a note, I know that we know you through, you participated in our Earth Centered Futures course. Um, there are ways to get more info. And I just wanted to mention that our sister organisation, the New Economy Network Australia, has both a particular participatory budget process fused into its governance um, and we'll soon be looking at running citizens assemblies to get lots of people to allocate what they think the federal budget should be spent on each year and so that's a way of both reaching out across broad populations to get their views on something that's often not open to the public to talk about um, which is the, the federal budget and um, then citizens assemblies is a process that can be used for any issue and do look up the People's Tribunal. I'm sure Christina will be able to pop the, the link in there. And the reason I do mention it is um, one of Anthony's many excellent points was we really have to think about planning law in Australia because our planning laws are directly allowing harm. And conveniently, here's one we prepared earlier, uh, AILA is literally about to launch, I think it's next week or the week after, we've got an evening webinar launching the people's, uh, the citizens' inquiry into Australia's planning laws. And um, our tribunal has done some really nice work with very limited, as in no budget whatsoever, volunteer lawyers, amazing people like Gwyn, and also Indigenous leaders like Mary Graham, Ross Williams, Irene Watson was involved earlier um, in one of our first tribunals where we literally hold, listen to, call forth testimonies and witnesses and information and evidence about issues because often governments are the last ones who wanna talk about ecological limits or ecological justice. Um, so it's really just a citizen space. So please keep in touch with us if any of that resonates uh, with Citizens Assemblies There's an excellent little group called the Coalition of Everyone. And there's also a number of other groups in Australia who run Citizens Assemblies. And that's a very different process again, which I won't take up any more time, but I'm really passionate about it because I think having these broader voices our democracy is working very calmly and nicely to some extent, but it is limited in its capacity to bring on lots of different voices to be heard on particular issues. Okay, um, I might take the liberty of um, starting to wrap up. Apologies to anyone whose questions we didn't get to, um, but um, because 
during Earth Laws Month, we've got many, many events. Uh, and I've got two more webinars today, so I'm going to clock off myself so I can have a break. But can I please say a huge thank you to all of our speakers. Um, thank you to uh, Gwyn McCarrick, Rob White, Anthony Burke and Del Danielle Salamaya. And also to our wonderful, um, I was going to call her my offsider, which is a bit flippant, but our wonderful young lawyer, Christina Myers um, from our Australian Earth Laws Centre. And as always, a huge thank you to all of you. Um, just so generous of you to spend your time with us and generous of our speakers to discuss these important issues. If you are interested in staying connected to any of the work that any of us are trying to do on Ecoside, please send us an email, ayla at earthlaws.org.au. So that's A-E-L-A -A at, thank you, Christina's popped it in the chat. Um, there are so many different aspects. You can join up and become um, part of the Aussie branch of the international efforts. We are very, very tiny and need more people to actually do things. People come and go and get bored because it does feel a bit distant, you know, writing letters to ministers and saying you should think about ecocide at the international level. But I think our work here in Australia is going to get lots more traction. We've got amazing people like Gwyn McCarrick, Rob White, Anthony Burke, Danielle, Christina, and I can see Lucy Watts in here too. She's part of our working group. Sorry, Lucy, didn't see you before. Um, if you're interested, just connect. We would love to have you more involved. Um, other than that, I will stop talking. Uh, let all our speakers say farewell. Um, but thank you so much, everybody. Oh, we've got Marie Rydell there saying hello. She met us during the um, Citizens Inquiry down on the Darling River. Lovely to see you, Marie. Um, but yeah, others in the panel, please do say goodbye. Goodbye. Thank goodbye. you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>